from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. All right, so we're back in virtual studio with Kate and Adam, and uh, we're returning to the science fiction science fiction conversation. And uh, I couldn't be happier to be with my friends again in studio and working on something fun. So, um, how's it going, guys? What's the what's the timeline like? Ha <laughs> ha. Like our book timeline or <laughs> timeline of the character? Let's uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you guys let me know that you guys are working on something cool, something special, something structural in terms of a timeline. And that's a that's a really good place to start the episode, I think. Yeah, super great. I'm gonna let it load. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so we use we use a cool software called Miro because it kind of lets us brainstorm and interact considering we're all remote here. So um I'm just gonna can I share? I'll share. Uh, yep. all can just, look. Hold on, this is this is groundbreaking. This is like our first like actual like episode where we don't just philosophize, we put pen to paper, right? Move the needle right. forward. Yeah. Yeah the needle forward all right come on a journey with me through time tell me when you can see it when it's up there i'm sure you dan have to use some sort of thing to push it forward I thought so but there we go Bob all right i i thought you'd want to see this this is our little antipus and we are living in the greenhouse because that's where all the ideas uh, are planted. Okay, so we're going to zoom over there. We'll zoom over to the greenhouse. And that's where we've put our structure of our book. So let's, uh, it's still loading. Here, we're moving a bit slow. Aha, the AK book, otherwise known as AK. <laughs> Right. Okay, so we started at 2020 and we've progressed along. And you know what? You know how we talked about maybe it's not 600 years in the future? We actually only made it to 336 when we actually did the calculations. Huh. So maybe it's not 600 years in the future. Maybe it's only 300. <laughs> so what we started with is the blue... The blue tabs or the blue sticky notes are like the timeline of the human, the human lifespan. And so like this is his genealogy, if you would, or her genealogy or their genealogy going back. So the grandparents age, the parents age when they had kids, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that is a yellow sticky are like pivotal, pivotal moments that have actually created a shift in the way things are done. And then these are kind of the outfalls in red of different areas, whether it's like economy or the medical industry or things that we're just calling out that have happened along the way. So that's kind of where we got started. So we start right back here, like uh, great, great grandma's 30, great grandma's five is where it was. And so that's from our, our main character's role back to today. Where do we want to navigate, guys? Um, let's just maybe just zoom in and go left to right. Like I think you can see yeah. right off the yeah. bat, man. It was easier for us to forecast like the first hundred years. And then after that, you know, it was it was a little less fuzzy, which is ultimately why we ended up shrinking the timeline because we realized it's harder to predict the further out further out we go, the more kind of crazy it could get <laughs> crazy and maybe less relatable it becomes right so uh 
Yeah, the the healthcare vaccine outbreak. We we definitely included this as a pivotal moment for a few different reasons. I think, right? One kind of like pushing the world towards this more virtual business interaction, and two, we kind of predicted like a a shift in the healthcare system at some point, right? As a result. Like it. Yes. Kind of the pivotal thing that has like happened. Like there's so many variants and things like it's just gone crazy in the virus world. And then the issues from vaccines that we're trying to roll out before they're tested. And then all this huge health issue and all of the stuff that falls out of this. So we got the first man on Mars, which I think we're pretty close to a huge uptake in bio research. Um, and that stems from like trying to find different vaccines and understanding uh, companies. Everything is hosted on VR tech by this time. And we're only talking like a few years out, right? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> maybe we can we can name this, uh, you know, research company or this company that <clears throat> uh, actually puts the man on Mars and, you know, integrates biology into the into human. We could call them like the Keelan Tusk or something like that, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Because <laughs> you know you've got like that it. disclaimer at the beginning of the uh, at, at at the beginning of the of the novel that says any resemblance to people fictional or otherwise or purely coincidental or something like that. Yeah, right. Right. Could get really have change to protect their identity. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> or you could say, or you could say, you, you know, fuck the disclaimer and say any reference to people in the book that um, are purely intentional. <laughs> there you go. Purely right? intentional. I meant to stir the shit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, totally. Okay. So we like some of these things like may or may not come true, but like, okay, there's a huge population decrease. Um, so people owning their own vehicles was something that we said is going to go away. No need. You can have a vehicle on demand. Why would you maintain one? Why would you have one? Unless you're super rich, like why bother? Right. It's just okay. so easy to get access to, to transportation. I want to, I want to, this may be an opportunity for a little bit of cross promotion here, but I'm, I do a recorded episode with, uh, Steve Keen, he's an economist, and we were just talking about that last night, was the world uh, population decreases. And so we began the conversation, and it started around um, a reduction, and this is a climate change issue, but it's a reduction of, um, I guess, the usage of our resources by one-tenth, and that means going to a standard of living that was like the 60s or the 70s basically is what he's he's saying is going to be a reality and so um i brought up the idea that our 8.9 billion uh population is could go from you know we could reduce an order of magnitude so basically take a zero off of that right Right. So when we're starting to scaffold in the the story, there's like a book from um, I think David Wallace Wells, where there's predictive um, there's predictions about where we're going to go and the consequences that are going to happen um, related to climate change in his book. Okay. So. I'm not saying that you have to take that and use that verbatim, at least e even conceptually, but they're very good uh, points for research, okay? And especially if we're going to look at a, a world population decrease, that's the kind of research that I think could help inform the inspiration for the storytelling. Yeah, hmm. I like okay. it. I like it. The The other thing that we talked about around this kind of thing is like um, the population decreases. And I liked where you're going with the like going back to like minimal resources and minimalists. And so there's a huge trend on like 
going to a minimalist lifestyle, but you're also seeing like to tie this all together, you're also seeing the younger population right now isn't interested in getting their license, right? Like it's a push and it's not like it's because they're in a city where they have access to public transit. They just have access to everything through their virtual world. Why do they need to leave? They can talk to their friends. Like when I was a kid, the only way you talk to your friends is you picked up the freaking landline that was corded. Right. And I, I just missed the party line time frame, but like you dialed their number, you talked to their parents and then you asked if you could play. And then you got to get like, you physically had to get together or go knock on their door. Now they can be connected to their friends in a second at any time. They don't need to leave the house. So there's this move away from that and we're seeing it now. And so this is where this kind of idea stemmed from is that like, there's not really going to be a whole bunch of people who are gearing up to go get their driver's license and pay for a car and maintain it and do all this stuff. They, you know, can I have somebody solve that problem? I'll just call an Uber, right? Or, or whatever. Um, maybe in the future, it's called a Vuber <laughs> in our book, right? <laughs> but like, so, so this is, this, this is actually a reality that we're starting to see. I'm, I'm oddly, um, I'm oddly bullish on the, um, on, on the adoption of technology um, with every new generation, there's um, they don't know what it used to be like. And the, the new generation, if they integrate into technology and let's say the check boxes are, um, are checked in terms of healthy relationships. And that's, that's a big question mark, right? But mm-hmm. Communities can still gather online in unique and beneficial ways. Now, to say that they can't at all, and this is a failure and 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 collapse of of, of societies and friendships and relationships, I don't know if we need to jump quite there yet and say, is it possible with with online environments to be able to do that? Right? I mean, certainly we lose something, but I think Kate, you're on to something. At least there was. Um, you know, even a, a even a movie from Steven Spielberg about about plugging in online and the virtual worlds that we're actually going to be moving into, right? I mean, yeah. I can be that superhero. I can be that character that I want to be. Um, y- you know, in an in an online environment, and to a certain degree, we we do that now, anyways, right? Yeah. Even you know, who who's what kind of person do you want to are you at a party, um, you know, kind of thing, right? Even if, if it's a small group or who do you represent to your friends, which type, what kind of archetypal sort of positions do people do you inhabit while you, you know, in the relationships you form, right? So interesting. I, I agree with you, Dan. Like, you know, I, I saw a comment on LinkedIn actually yesterday and they were talking about innovation and the comment was innovation happens like at the water cooler and the you know interactions in the hallways like virtual working doesn't have that therefore a hybrid program is the only solution and then but i say okay well our company is completely virtual and i would say we innovate the hell out of everything <laughs> so it's not necessary it's definitely a, a change and it's not like you can just swap one one thing for the other thing but uh i just think if you're used to it and you're you're kind of like you said every new generation we actively put innovation into our process right we push on it so we push on it it's it's a value it's a core value of ours we integrate it into our daily process it's in the way we do business versus companies that rely on innovation to happen organically and they don't have it systemized i agree with you then they're going to struggle right because that's where innovation did happen but companies who have actively built innovation into their processes maybe they will still innovate in a fully digital world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, you know, in our story here, I don't think it's dystopian. I think it's hopeful, right? Like, I I kind of, you know, 
Um, Let's talk about the stock crash for a minute. Yeah. Sure. So is it an opportunity to say that there's a, a switch to, um, you know, maybe watch that series and pay some attention to Steve Keen. He's got some serious, mm -hmm. like yeah. really, really valid um, ideas. Um, and as a, uh, a leading authority on post Keynesian economics, he's, um, he's really trying to upset the apple cart and prove and that I don't use that word lightly. I, I, I do that. I use the word prove in the exact meaning um, of, of a Newtonian sense. He's working on a proof to submit to the Royal Society to show why the classical neo or the neoclassical economic models are, are flawed and incorrect. And so he looks at our current economic models as more of a, a dogma, uh, like almost like a religion. And that's odd coming from a, you know, somebody of, with an empirical and, and, and economic background, but he does feel that to be the case. And he was invited by the Royal Society, which is Newton's paper, right? Um, mm -hmm. To submit an article. Uh, or you know to the journal that's a big deal right oh, it's yeah. a real big deal and so he's feeling that not in his lifetime will this be actualized or realized until it's necessary and imagine a, a stock crash right the crash right so the crash of 2008 we know there's a mortgage issue um but there's in economics there's things like the um, the concept of equilibrium, which is um, a load of baloney, apparently, according to Professor Keene. So there is no state of steady equilibrium in, a, in an economic model, right? Yeah. And so <clears throat> if, we, if we go through a, a, a disastrous crash and there is a rebuilding of sorts, that quite honestly could happen around the 2040 mark. I mean, there's so much legacy technology floating around and lo legacy thought um, that's supposed to take us to this particular time period. You see governments planning to 2030 and you see this by 2030, by 2040, we will be carbon neutral or we will do this. And, you know, um, companies are doing that as well. So I think there's a very good possibility to paint that kind of picture. Now, I want to be careful that I'm not projecting my, um, you know, climate centric um, views onto <clears throat> what you guys are trying to, the story you guys are trying to. No, um, but your input is greatly appreciated because like, as far as like knowledge on the economies and, and stocks, like Adam and I might skim the surface compared to somebody like Mr. Keene or like the same on the environmental side with you. Like we want input from experts to say, Hey, I think this is happening. And animals that Adam and I can say, yeah, let's include that. That's, that'll be a good, good critical point that we may or may not bring forward in the story, but it helps us build this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Love it. One thing we talked about when we were building this was like, we don't have to explore explain the in outs of the, the event. We just say it happened, this is that, right? Um, you know, we got a yeah. line in there for political change and you know, political economic changing or evolution or whatever. You know, do, do I really want to make a political statement about, you know, this system or that system? Maybe not really, but I want to say that like, hey, something had to give and something new came out of it, right? something along those lines right um yeah this, this is the realm where yeah maybe it would be very beneficial to talk to uh somebody more versed in politics or economics or whatever right educate us a little bit so we can make a better timeline a better plan versus just like throwing the dart right yeah um Western democracy revolt and collapse. Wow, let's talk about that. 
All right. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of what I was just. So I got this idea from the book Starship Troopers. And I don't know if you guys saw the movie that was in the 90s, right? It, had, it was really nothing, the actual book. Um, the actual book is actually kind of a, a political Lost statement. Does that count? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Were there gay women bugs in it? <laughs> no, uh, it was most <laughs> off humor. Okay, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> In Starship Troopers, it's a democracy, uh, but you're only allowed to vote if you're a citizen. And the way you become a citizen is you serve in the military for X number of years, right? The same way some European countries require you to, right? The point is, when you serve in the military, what you're learning is to be part of something greater than yourself. So you become, your mindset changes from just like, well, I want, uh, you know, more of this, more of that, more of that to, you know, the old JFK, right? Like not, not what the country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? So it's that shift. And then that creates a more educated basis for there's this democracy. Anyway, I thought that was kind of a neat idea. So I threw that in there just as kind of like a, a placeholder for like, should we even go there? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's a place where you don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. I don't know. But it's worth discussing. Okay. I think it's a great idea, actually. Uh, <laughs> that's a revolt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But there's, there's something in there because here's – okay, so I want to give you guys a perspective. It's not – I'm not advocating for it in any way, but the there's there's – a conversation right now in culture that we've become too individualistic. And so I'm thinking of a thinker named Ben Shapiro, who's an Orthodox Jew and um, a very, very um, powerful thinker, <laughs> really, and a very, very good debater. Um, I, I really respect him, actually. Um, and he, have you guys heard of him? No? Okay. So... He's basic, basically re trying to return to more um, core values, okay? And he's he's saying that you know shutting off from technology on <clears throat> on on Friday night because the the Sabbath for uh, the Jew is on 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 Saturday, right? So he 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 takes deliberate time to to disconnect so that he can you know, reconnect or disconnect with his family that he's not tethered to Twitter and all this kind of stuff, right? So anyways, where I'm going with this is that he sees that there's um, society is disproportionately propping up the individual to a point where we're forgetting what the what makes a community strong. Right. And so it is less about the individual. It should be less about the individual and the individual's feelings as, you know, what makes a community strong and what we're implicitly buying into into our social contracts, both at the community and the the um, uh, the national level, the country level. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, the contentious part that he um, very publicly attacks are. If if you want to um, describe yourself as gender, whatever gender you want to describe yourself as, um, he's saying that's fine, <laughs> but but you can't force me to do that. And biologically, there are still men and women. There are some biological anomalies, but you know you know where that conversation is going, right? So he's 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 saying. I don't care what you feel. <laughs> There's still a difference between um, how, what you project with your feelings and what reality is and what's needed for a culture to um, coalesce and uh, bond over like problem solutions, right? And so this is really contentious as you can imagine, right? You know, and uh, is there a return? You know, to to more of a 
you know, the sum is, is, is greater than, or, you know, the, the sum is greater than, than the, 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 sum, the, the its parts. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the idea is that, you know, it's, it's not all about you. It's not all about the individual. It's about trying to, to, to remove, remove the individual from the center of the universe and try and say, okay, well, what is, what is the goal of this group, this organization, this company, this initiative, right? So that's kind of the idea. No, I, you know, and it makes me wonder, you know, we're talking about like, you know, living online, interacting online, and the world becomes a smaller place. And we're talking, you know, things like climate change. Right. That is something that benefits the whole, you know, long term versus the idea of like me short term, you know, maybe making money off exploiting the environment. Right. Um, you know, maybe there's something to be said there as we all kind of like start to interact online and you know, we're all fighting in chat rooms and stuff. But like, um, is there like overall a bit of a shift towards this? Um, kind of more global mindset or we're in this together type idea, right? Maybe that's a good thing that comes out of um, this series of events, right? Or maybe we go through. Yeah, or maybe we actually get more individualized. So like one of the things that drives me nuts right now with democracy is that I've got to vote for a party who I don't agree with their entire platform, but I might agree with the majority of their platform. Mm. Right. But I might have another party that I like what they're saying about this one issue. Mm. And why do I have to pick one party to handle all issues? Perhaps we then become more individualistic where we get to decide what, what pieces of the platform we actually vote for. Maybe we decide that, okay, my taxes aren't going to the government to divvy up. I'm going to decide what's important to me as my family and put my percentages of my taxes to those. And if you've got funding because the majority of the, the world cares, you can do something. And if you don't, it's because no one cares about that issue. Maybe it becomes because it'll be so much easier for the individual to have input and to track all that and to transfer funds and to do this. So we don't need a big onerous government who, you know, has an entire group of people managing income tax audits, which should have been temporary. That was never supposed to be a permanent solution and drives the wrong behaviors versus the sale tax, which drives the right behaviors. Yeah. So like, yeah. this whole thing maybe does become really individualistic. And your communities don't become your neighbors. They become the people who have the same individualistic views on you no matter as you no matter where they are, because we're connected so closely by a tech. Yeah. Okay. I like that. That's pretty cool. And we're it's actually a strong vision, that. It really is. Yeah. Vote we're for actually... Caitlin for president. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, here's a great example, Ben. We're, we're seeing this in uh, like giving programs in companies, right? It's typically, a company will choose a charity or series of charities, and that's who they give to, right? And as an employee, you can donate toward it, and that's it. But what we're seeing now is programs where you can pick whatever, right? Like you put your money in, and you get to pick which causes or whatever you want it to go for. And then the company just matches and it goes to like a bunch of different places. But you, the individual, are engaged because, you know, you're passionate about climate change. So that's where I want my donations to go, right? So it's like a shift from, you know, the skybox controls everything to what do you want to do? Right? Uh, it's a cool yeah. idea. Add it, to the, add it to the timeline here, Keelan. Okay. So maybe a note to add to that, I think, to clarify that is that you're voting for ideas as opposed to people and and platforms. Right. So is this a good idea? And there's a self um, like hi hierarchical function that you can you can run to say, here's a priority. Right. Um, 
you know, and that's really interesting. I, I don't know if it's problematic that people would say, hey, you know, we're not going to vote for infrastructure, or we're not going to fix the roads, or we're not going to, there's some things that just happen with the government that we don't really realize about, like the law and legal system, right? I mean, right. do we really have to think that our money goes to this, you know, to support this, like, infrastructure type of system? Um, I've often thought, I think, like, Kate, you were um, thinking about is that the, the government seems to have a, um, like, a, a lot of unnecessary, uh, like, redundant systems, right? And so, do we need that? Uh, it doesn't mean that people don't have jobs, but it means, like, what can we free up people's time, you know, to pursue well, other things? And, and, it's, and it's all, like, with good intentions crappy execution and there's so much so much of this right like we just put in a job grant application for training and it went back and forth like six times with little like little things that i'm like come on guys like the inf here's the information here like pointing it out here it is okay well this isn't right rejected no it's there here it is oh, okay well this is so it's like oh my goodness right <laughs> This is a, this could be all solved super easily with tech and like look at the daycare thing that they did in Alberta where they said, hey, we're going to pick some daycares and subsidize it. What did it do? It shut down a ton of daycares because everybody went to those subsidized ones and then other people didn't have daycare. And then there's a daycare shortage now. Mm. Nobody wanted to pay. Everybody wanted to try to get on the subsidized list. And it was like it caused a huge outfall that they didn't best intention. Great idea because daycare prices are ridiculous. Yeah. But the execution had all of this subsequent problems. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get on my off my soapbox soon, but let me do another one. Is you go and fix um, let's say <clears throat> on a reserve, they need better sanitary systems, right? You go and fix the sanitary systems by installing sanitary uh locations and then you don't give them the tools and the needs to fix it and this happened not here in north america but in another country and the project fails well that's not a project failing that is a you know a subsequent problem that needs to be solved but a government stops at the first failure and says the project failed because the switch of government happens and they're, they're coming back going, well, that project failed because it was the wrong choice. No, 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 no. Everything has a subsequent issue. You need to solve it. So I'm off my. Yeah, no. And I, I think what we're getting at here is. With things we've outlined here, right? Strain on healthcare system, uh, a virtual world. You know, we've got off planet mining, all this kind of stuff happening. The world economies have to get better because they're they're failing they're you know they're all in debt and they're all you know they're, they're not able to respond effectively right yeah so you know the the need maybe it's overpopulation we have population goes down but then maybe it goes back up like you know in order to um to survive it, it shifts or it changes like you said so i'm very interested to um learn more about economics because I, I, you know, I really believe that economics drives everything. You know, you can say you want to stop global warming, but until the economics makes sense around it, nothing's going to change. Right. Right. Until so, solar becomes viable and it doesn't need to be subsidized. Yeah. Can we really run the world on solar? Not yet. Mm -hmm. Should we push towards it? Sure. <laughs> um, but we can't, we can't, run our lives on hopes and dreams. <laughs> um, anyway, so we kind of got on a rabbit hole there, but uh, Sorry. Thing that, that's all right. That's what we're here for. I wanted to, to uh, chat with you a little bit about this AI thing. Kate and, I, Kate and I imagined, you know, with the amount of information out there and it, things being digital and things interacting, I do, judicial system where an AI could like gather facts in a sense. Right now we've got lawyers that present sides and you really play playing off people's emotions, trying to convince people one way or another. But if it came to like, you know, uh, an, an AI 
algorithm that just like gather the facts and play it and then maybe the other human make decision like maybe the entire court system becomes much more effective that way and this is this is adam's huge based on this so if there becomes a way like if there becomes a kind of let's call it a a system in which people have to operate in a secure blockchain way through corporations that is governed by legal, then all they have to do is say, release this information. And it, and all of it will be tracked, it'll be verified, it'll be put into a blockchain system. Right? So this has to happen in order for us to have an AI judicial system because otherwise they'll say, oh, we're not, we still have paper records, but if there becomes something that, and what is that thing that makes everybody have to operate in this secure system? There has to be something that drives that because this is happening. And some people are operating in blockchain really good for multiple people interface where there's not trust because now you can hand off goods and services without having to validate, verify or whatever, because there's a blockchain built into this the process, right? And now you trust that party. So what pushes everybody to, to jump onto the blockchain platform to run their businesses and to run the governments or economies securely? There has to be some sort of uh, pivot thing. And I think that's the thing. Cybersecurity. Um, well, <clears throat> I think... Um, Okay, so imagine writing uh, a, a time, uh, not a timeline, but an alternative story, okay, where yeah. let's, let's look at um, uh, a country that's having, like, like uh, right now, on the verge of economic collapse, right? There's some countries out there that we could, you know, model this off of. Yeah. And the government said, you know, highly corrupt. There's a lot of, there's a lot of countries that are just so flawed with, the, the the corruption and the way the efficiency is just almost non-existent non-existent right it's so corrupt it's just so difficult to keep things uh, moving and so if if that if that country says hey you know what let's completely move uh, you know to a uh, a crypto model okay. And here's how we're going to do it. Now, if we look at, at that particular country and they start um, thriving or they start doing really well, there's your empirical um, use case. Those, I think, would be a good model to say, you know, to say the, the like, say, the U.S. government, right? Or, you know, the big superpowers that say, well, we're not going to move away from uh you, you know our stock markets and our our currency models and all these types of things right but if we had countries that started to become more prosperous and 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 more efficient with that decentralized model then i think that would be the way that it would start to spread i'm guessing right yeah so you do like a character you're introducing the character you're putting in the the drama you're you're telling that story and you know maybe it's something where you know grandmother remembers what it used to be like when when uh you know it was horrific in the in the in the 2020s right i'm thinking venezuela for example right um or you could do iran right where there's economic sanctions because of the control of the um you know the 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 military government right and you know these types of things so you know maybe that just opens up prosperity to world citizens and you know the government say you know what we're tired of this it's like just make it a non decentralized currency and then we're you know we're good right i don't know that it's no, yeah and i think because I, I like where you're going and i think because it's after the revolt and the collapse. This could be part of the rebuild. Like you want in, you do it this way. I um I had a conversation um, with a cryptocurrency expert. He builds platforms for this, right? Yeah. And 
what he was saying is is that um, it's so so open source that it 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 almost eliminates a a power structure at the top, and I don't know if that's entirely true, right? Because there's still only going to be certain groups that can actually take it and have the technical ability to deploy it. But what it's it is kind of like open market, right? Mm. So. Um, yeah, very interesting, very interesting way. Um, you know, it's almost like economic ecosystems within ecosystems. So like, say for example, I bought into the Enta, uh, currency model and it becomes like this economic model in itself, right? You, you, you get into that ecosystem and you become part of the, right? <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> and to currency, that just made me super happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! You press on a you press on a special button. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't I don't know what to do next. I press the button. I'm, I don't. I'm a little teenager. I don't know what to do next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I now want my own cryptocurrency. Right. There you go. What do you know about the cryptocurrency, Adam? Uh, very little, I would say. Not enough to speak intelligently, as intelligently as I'd like on it. Um, for me, when I read stuff about people saying, oh, is this temporary or oh, it's, this won't work or whatever, Sounds to me the same as when people said, oh, this internet thing is temporary or people don't need computers in their home, right? It has the same like flavor to it. And, um, you know, I couldn't sit here and argue with it one way or another. I'm not educated enough on it, but just it feels like the future in, in my opinion. So, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be early adopters that move it forward. I I don't see the necessity to take money from my bank account and move it over to an early adopt um, adoption yeah. structure. Like I just I, it, I it's confusing because the only potential upside that I see initially is that I can buy at X and then I can it's going to be valued at X plus something, right? Mm. And yeah, I, I agree. We're not there this yet. is not a priority right now. That it, it's just. At least for, uh, you know, regulars. if I had lots of money and I was an investor and I was playing around, maybe I do take a million bucks and throw it in cryptocurrency and see what happens, right? But that's because I can afford that level of risk, right? Um, it's going to start with that high risk in the early adopters and it's slowly going like, to come down to where it reaches an acceptable level where, you know, us mortals can be like, oh, yeah, I could, I could do that, right? So, I don't know, we'll see, we'll kind of, at least in our story, I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know enough to speak intelligently either. I know a little bit and it excites me. I think it's the future. I think it's crazy that we have cash. I think it's crazy we spend I have money. To, I, have to pause you there, Kate. I have to pause you because you remember we're being recorded, right? So the yeah. thing is, is that if you get super, when you get super famous, right, you always have to take and add something to the end of your statement, right? You can't say, I, I don't know enough to speak intelligently about something. You can't just leave it at, I don't know enough to speak intelligently. Because right? that clip, that <laughs> clip, will, that clip viral. will blow up the internet, right? It's like, no. okay, no. Sure, no. Next Perfect. Of, of Canada. Here's Kate, and they're going to go back to this video, and they're going to go, know. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know how to speak intelligently over and Look, over and over again. So let's qualify yeah, that. Yeah, but we can plug that in the about part Canada. anyway. I'm, my name is Kate, and I'm the Prime Minister of Canada. And for the Americans watching, that is like the equivalent of the president. Okay? So there we have it. We're gonna, Kate's going to be the second, let's remind the Americans what, you know, watching, the second Prime Minister of Canada, a female. Right? Okay. The second one. No, Canada did it first. No one wants my heart. Truth. No one huh? wants my heart. Truth. 
<laughs> I'm not running. Don't put my name on the ballot. <laughs> well, that's exactly how you're going to win. It's going to be an election through negation. It's like, no, I will not do it. So the louder you say you won't do it, the more votes you get. Really? Oh, my God. Could you imagine? That would be just really, really, really horrible. <laughs> You wake up in the morning. You wake up in the morning. We were talking about this awakening. You wake up in the morning and it's like you you look at your computer printout or your computer, you know, your screen, your HUD, right? And it's like, oh, fuck, I'm the prime minister today? What the fuck is going on here? <laughs> okay. Approve, 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 approve. <laughs> you're not you're not ready for that kind of change world. Trust me, my yeah, you're not ready. <laughs> what would you okay. do? What? Uh, what would I? What wouldn't I do? All I right, would flip sure. everything on its head. Like, like you saw right there. Immediately, sales tax. Sales tax would be the only tax. It would be raised up to. You wouldn't get income tax. You work a dollar, you get a dollar. But we want to push people to buy. We want to push money into the economy. And then sales tax is done such that it pushes the right behaviors. Let's say you have a ton of packaging on your product. You get taxed more, corporation, because you are now causing us to have to recycle. Um, run more garbage dumps and facilities and stuff like that. So now you actually drive behaviors, stuff like that. I would change. That's actually smarter than the idea that I had, which was to make all taxes a lottery. <laughs> Cause somehow there's like a psychological switch when someone's like, okay, they have no money. They, they buy the lotto, whatever the heck it is. They're like, yes, I'm going to go and spend this money. And they're so happy to spend it because there's a chance they're going to win something. Really, they're just paying taxes, right? I mean, taxes with the chance that you might get some a big return. Hey, what if what if we ran weekly fifty fifties that were like innovation tax, but the fifty percent of it went to just a random winner, the rest of it goes into the innovation pot to help us move like, you know, Bingo. good innovations for it. I like that idea, right? It's like that's how we can solve the solar problem and the you know, get get off the fossil fuels. It's Dan's innovation tax lottery. It's not mine. It's Kate's. You're the prime minister for crying out loud. It was your idea. Okay. Your I just idea. wear a bucket hat. I just got a bucket hat. Okay, it's the bucket <laughs> hat lottery. No. <Nope>. Okay. All right. <laughs> Give credit where credit's due, man. Love it. But like, yeah, I would change a lot of stuff. Like, it would be run like a like a corporation. There'd be measurements. There'd be like you don't make KPIs, you're out kind of thing, right? Because part of the problem is that there's, there's no, there's no push like there is in a corporation to make, to make changes, to make profits, to get that right. It's kind of like a plug along, right? Try to get as much done while you're in office. But if somebody says to me, Hey, you have four years to run ENTA, and then everything's going to change. Do I really do the right choices? Am I driving the right behaviors? Yeah. I'm not care. I, how much do I care about the long term, right? Yeah, well, that's the election cycle for you, right? So maybe we should all um, we should adopt the the Soviet model, and uh, you know, or or it, like. I don't know, some sort of return to a monarchy or something like that. <laughs> well, that's where the idea of like voting for ideas and not for people is great because as long as that mm -hmm. idea has, has the backing, has the money, has the push forward, then it's a viable project to go to completion. I'm very sympathetic about filling in those applications. Now, this is taking it outside of the, the science fiction piece for just a minute. Um, we're all in Canada and uh, we have a little bit more of a social government and there's programs that we can apply for. Right. And so you're right. There's best intentions, but um, I, I had submitted something uh, kind of similar for a grant, I guess. Right. And uh, uh, for one of my clients on in, in the tiny home business builds houses and all this kind of stuff. The guy's incredible. He was a, a Polish immigrant and he um, came in the eighties. To Canada, uh, built a factory, um, owns his land in Richmond. So it's like, you know, all paid off, like a real success story, right? And so he applies for uh, a grant at my prompting. 
And the rubric for approval on the grant is to say, do you have um, uh, like a native, like a, a Native American hiring policy? Are you, what are you doing about just like uh, inclusion in the workplace or people of um, hiring visible minorities? Um, He's kind of like, I don't know, I'm lucky if I get any applications because people don't apply to work here. So it's kind of like the oh, rumor. They're not asking you like that. They're asking if you have a piece of paper, which does absolutely nothing. That's the mm. problem. Yeah, I can write a hundred policies in my company and look like I'm all jazzy jazzy, but <laughs> like, do I actually move the needle? That yeah, is it, is it relevant? Are we just trying to put our own political agenda into the processes, or again, in your case, are we are we just you know impregnating the process with bureaucracy that is like head scratching, right? Yeah, I think you know maybe this is a good one to exit on, but I think the <laughs> the reason for that is because it's easier to check a box and, and do a piece of paper to really drive change. This is a long term focused effort. So it's easier to say done, right? But imagine, okay, but imagine a world where everybody is in this secure realm and all their data and their measurements and their metrics and what they're actually moving the needle on is captured. And you could say it'll auto feed that information. These guys have actually hired this many, you know, Mm. from the aboriginal communities in the past year it's already in the system they just pull it forward like now we're talking about really moving and i mean we might be a couple hundred years out from that but let's uh i mean we only made it to 2140 still we still got another 150 years to go here there you go. yeah right. more brainstorming we have a ton of work to do for next episode not for but even to talk about for next episode. So I, are you guys happy with that? I love this. Yeah. I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Till next week, and stay epic and awesome every day. Bye.